Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our chats uh, at Upstream. Uh, and today I had this afternoon, I should say rather, uh, have Carmen Bianca Baker of uh, the reuse project from the Free Software Foundation Europe. And, you know, we've been talking today about what it is that we owe each other. And traditionally in open source, one of the very key critical things that we have owed each other is what is our license? What is it that we give each other software under? Because um, a, core, a core plank, if you will, of how open source and free software, of course, before that has uh, functioned is an irrevocable promise under a license to allow people to use, modify, and redistribute. Uh, as our software has gotten more complex, corporate users in particular have increasingly demanded not just the right licenses, but the right metadata about licenses. When we had five packages in our application, it was easy to say, oh yeah, we'll just read the license files. Uh, but now that we have 5,000 packages in an application, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, and so uh, Carmen works on the reuse project, which is an initiative to standardize information about licensing across all free and open source software projects in a way that is I think, um, and I'd love to talk some more about this, both you know, human friendly, but also very much machine readable so that when we are building these towering piles of software, we can understand the whole, um, the whole thing. So, um, so Carmen, first of all, congrats. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, reached 1.0, did a 1.0 release. Uh, that's an awesome milestone. The project has been going on for, for several years now, right? Yes, correct. I, I joined the project uh, in its infancy in 2017 when I was a, an intern for the FSFV and uh, I kind of stuck around. <laughs> in the way of all great free software projects, uh, the, yeah. the best people just sort of get sucked in. Yeah. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when I joined the FSFV, I was supposed to work on something completely different, but that kind of fell through because of uh, scheduling. And I saw this uh, project lying around, the reuse project, and I was like, oh, I know a little bit about uh, software licensing. I, I, I can do this while I'm waiting on the other project to pick up. The other project never picked up, uh, and this kind of it, yeah, became my thing. <laughs> well, very cool. Um, so what drew you to, I mean, well, so you were just saying it was there, but what's made you stick with it for five years? Um, because I, I, I do like programming, uh, but I, I like this project in, in, in particular in a, in a very egotistical way because it's, it's, it's very core Python uh, in a sense. It just allows me to, to do really, really Pythonic stuff and improve my Python skills, but also because I've come to kind of care about software and licensing. Uh, and I'm also a little bit of a stickler for, for getting things exactly right. And this is the kind of project that helped helps people get things exactly right. Uh -huh. Well, let's talk a little bit more before we go into the, the whys and the, and the wherefores. I mean, for those who aren't familiar with reuse, uh, what is it like, so the what is getting done exactly right is licensing information, licensing metadata. How does reuse help with that? Uh, uh, reuse helped with that. It helps with that in the sense that so reuse is made of two parts. One, it's made of a specification uh, and and general guidelines to the developer, and two, it's made of a, a program. And they kind of uh, they kind of in sync with each other. Uh, the way reuse helps most of all, well, this is no, that would be very egotistical of me to say to say that it helps most of all because of the tool, but it helps because it has very clear instructions. And those instructions can very easily be verified using the tool. So it's 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 uh, the two reinforce each other. Right. So for those of you who are following along at home, uh, I believe it's reuse.software. Is that right? Is the uh, I do believe it's yeah, it's reuse.software. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I had no idea until I stumbled on reuse some years ago that dot software was a uh, was a top level <laughs> domain, but now you too also know that information. Um, yeah, so reuse.software, and yeah, like you say, it's very clear, specific uh, instructions for developers on how to do this thing. And then software, I, I don't think you should sell the software short, right? I don't think it's <laughs> egotistical to say um, mere documentation without validation. I, I think that's actually one of the core learnings of modern software 
as opposed to 10 or 15 years ago, right? There's much more of a sense of if it's not tested, if a computer can't help you do it, uh, then it's often not going to get done, right? And I think if anything, that's one of the key learnings of, you know, unfortunately in the day job at Tidelift uh, when I'm not hosting chats, uh, you know, one of the things that we have to do sometimes is go into very old software and try to understand what is the license. And uh, like you, I'm a stickler for getting things right. And um, yeah, that means sometimes I pull my hair out because I, I have to go, what were they thinking 18, 19, 20 years ago when they put this uh, software together that like they thought that this sort of jigsaw puzzle of license information was, was good enough, right? And so to some extent, you all are saying, hey, you know what, it's time for us to, I was gonna say professionalize, professionalize is a loaded word, but certainly standardize where our license information is, right? Yeah, and to just be as clear as possible uh, is, is the trick. And so one thing that, uh, I've forgotten the exact name for it, but it's, it's become really popular in the last five years or so is to, uh, yes, a single source of truth. And this, uh, the, the idea of reuse is by adding the, uh, the software, uh, the copyright and licensing information into the header of every single file, the information is as, as close as possible to, to the single source of truth. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that's one of the many, I think, things that reuse does really uh, nicely, right, is this idea that the single source of truth is the software and not some other database, some other. So, I mean, you all besides, um, actually, before we go into, you, you know, one of the things that I think is a neat uh, trick about reuse is that you have based what you've done you didn't invent it out of whole cloth, right? It's based on other older practices and standards, right? Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Right. So it, it's it's based on on a couple of things. Uh, a lot of the credit goes to the SPX, which was starting to really pick up steam by the time that reuse was getting started. Uh, and it kind of just, it, we noticed that the SPDX gave this very clear way of, of conveying information about uh, licensing, which, well, why not use that? And then the, the other uh, conventions that we kind of copied is most projects or a lot of projects already have like a, a blurb at the top, which says the copyright holder and the license. But this was never standardized. There was uh, just a massive text at the top of every file. And we're like, what if we could make that a bit smaller? That's really nice. And if we could standardize that so it works for every single iteration of license. Right. Um, what we also, one old thing that we partially kept and partially changed uh, is providing license files. So in most uh, repositories, you'll have the license file in all uppercase at the very root of the project. We change that into a licenses directory because most projects actually do have ultimately multiple licenses. Uh, and it's very unfortunate because this kind of breaks the nice uh, GitHub UI. Uh, where it sell, tells you what the, the license of the, the project is. Uh, we've bugged you, uh, sorry, we've bugged uh, GitHub a couple of times about that. Uh, they keep saying that they're, they're going to work on it, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hmm. I mean, I think this is actually one of the interesting tensions for, you know, not just for GitHub, right? We like to have a sort of polite, uh, a polite lie that we tell each other is, oh yeah, this package is under one license. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, often, I don't know about in our, most is a whole, we could do a whole nother talk about data on licenses. Uh, so I'll, I'll put that one aside for right now, but like, suffice to say, yeah, you're right. Many, many packages, certainly hundreds of thousands of packages do have well more than one license. And, a thing about reuse that I would imagine is some, somewhat challenging sometimes is that you make it hard to maintain 
that fiction, right? If you're doing reuse <laughs> properly, uh, you really have to sort of come clean about all the many licenses that are that are in there. Do you do you get pushback from developers because of that? Uh, I've not personally experienced any any pushback about that, other than of course not having the the single license file. But I think people are or developers are are realizing like yes, actually there are multiple licenses, so I might as well declare all of them. It's a bit more work, but well, reuse is ultimately a little bit more work. Right. Well, that's actually, that gets to one of the things like how, you know, our theme today again is what do we owe each other? And certainly one of the premises of reuse, I think it's fair to say is that as developers, we owe each other accurate license information. <laughs> And, um, you know, how do you go about, but, well, but, but also suffice to say that isn't necessarily something that we've actually, we might pay lip service to it, but we haven't done it very well in the past. Um, so how do you all like, you know, reuse as a group? How, how do you persuade, obviously step one is provide clear directions and step two is provide software, you know, but then you've got to go out and tell, like explain it to people. And what, what are the kinds of arguments that you use and, and how do you persuade people? Um, I think the arguments make themselves a little bit uh, in the sense that you have to do this anyway. And uh, when you turn it around and you're like, would you, when you're trying to find code uh, that you would like to use, would you like it to be reuse compliant or would you like the licensing to be an utter mess? Uh, then most people will be like, yeah, I'd, I'd like, I'd like it to be reuse. So the, the golden rule kind of applies, uh, do unto others as you, you know the rule. Um, so if everyone, I mean, this is a, a big uh, hope, I guess, but if everyone kind of did it, then it would make uh, the life of every developer a lot easier. Uh, as pertains persuading people to actually do it, this is a little bit harder, but we are doing a couple of things. Uh, some communities just adopt it. So I know the Linux kernel and the KDE community uh, have been adopting reuse or a variation of reuse um, internally. Uh, I also know that the European Next Generation Internet Project uh, mandates reuse compliance uh, as part of uh, all the projects that are delivered. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's cool. And certain companies uh, are also internally uh, in enforcing this. I know that the German... COVID tracing app is completely reuse compliant. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask, what are some, I mean, I knew about the Linux kernel uh, and I, as, a, as an old, you may or may not know, I'm an old GNOME guy. Uh, so I, I um, uh, maybe maybe I'll go nag some people over there, um, though it's now, <clears throat> now many generations away from when I was involved. But um, well, that, but the COVID tracing app, that's, that's very cool, very timely. Um, yeah. ha, you know, have any of the, um, I, I noticed in the 1.0 release and you mentioned that this is a very Pythonic uh, application and, and you know, I mean, I, I guess I hadn't thought of it that way, but it makes a lot of sense, right? Given that so much of Python's uh, strength is ultimately in text processing. And uh, this is at some level, right? A text analysis and processing app. Um, so I noticed that you distribute uh, the app through, uh, through Py, through PyPI. Uh, so you can pip install is it, what for, for our Python listeners, is it pip install reuse pip install? Uh, so if, if you, I would recommend to most new users to do a pipx install reuse. Okay. Pipx um, is, is the new hotness. Uh, it is, it is literally my job to keep up with these things. And yet it is still hard. Um, and, um, well, but so the, have you ever talked with any of like PyPI or uh, it sounds like you've talked to GitHub, which is obviously a key uh, part of the bigger uh, ecosystem. Have you ever talked to like PyPI, for example, about, and I know there's an ongoing discussion amongst Debian developers about whether or not or how to integrate reuse into Debian. Have you talked with like PyPI or NPM or any of those kinds of? Uh... I'm not aware of, uh, so I don't do a lot of the communications. I'm also not aware of any talks with uh, 
uh, PyPI. I think it could be cool, uh, but it's also, I think Python is a little bit behind uh, with regard to licensing anyway. I believe it was, uh, wasn't it NPM that really, yeah, NPM was the first to enforce a license. Like you have to choose a license if you want to distribute on NPM. I'm not sure if uh, Python ever adopted that. I'll just say it's complicated. Um, <laughs> and to your earlier point about SPDX, right? I mean, this is one of these things where, uh, as you know, when you're processing, uh, I should step back a second, uh, SPDX, something that Carmen mentioned earlier, is the software package data exchange format uh, or software program data exchange. I forget what the P is. I think but it's package, yeah. Yeah, spdx.org. It is a uh, it is it is a couple of things. One of them that's most relevant is that it is sort of a universal list of open source software licenses, free software licenses, and uh, and a set of standardized short. This is what all the license lawyers really love about it. Is more than anything else is, is a set of standardized short acronyms for licenses, right? So like MPL 2.0 is the standardized name for Mozilla Public License 2.0. Why I grimaced when you were mentioning PyPI, and this is not specific to PyPI, but PyPI for a variety of historical reasons, one of the more problematic ones is that it did not enforce SPDX as a, it slightly predates SPDX, I believe. So a lot of people put in license information that is, looks like SPDX, but it's not actually SPDX and good luck getting from, uh, you know, getting from one to the other, right? And I think this gets to this question of, and there are certainly many developers who, when you point it out to them, hey, what did you actually mean by this? Uh, they're mm -hmm. happy to take patches. They're happy to fix things up. But there are many others who are like, eh, good enough. Don't care. Um, yeah, or... I know. It's, it's, it's a bit dreadful. I maintain the Fedora package as well. Fedora also doesn't use SPDX. So for the... So the reuse tool itself is like four licenses because you know you borrow stuff, and one of the licenses is the CC by SA license, but it's just I think in Fedora it's just CC by without a version number, and it's it's dreadful. And there's no uh, we also have some CC zero stuff, and there's no CC zero in Fedora. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I know they, I mentioned Debbie, and I know Fedora is also having that discussion of how to uh, to modernize, right? I mean, this is one of these sort of unfortunate, you know, the, the, the XKCD comic about, you know, we have 16 standards, this is terrible. Okay, well, now we've created a 17th, so we'll, we'll create one standard to solve them all, and now we have 17 standards, right? Uh, SPDX is a little bit of that, right? Because it did actually grow out of the Fedora stuff, but getting it back into Fedora and the has been. Uh, I I follow along on that mailing list. Suffice to say, it's um, it's a lot of work to do, right? I mean, I think this is one of the things. You know, I I think this is one of the things that I I think is both fascinating and and so challenging about something like Fedora is that the good news is your I mean about reuse is that you're you're building on twenty five years of knowledge about licensing, but that also means there's 25 years of software to be fixed. Uh, yes. And some days, uh, I'm sure on your optimistic days, you're like, yes, we're gonna do this. And I would, if I were you on my more pessimistic days, I would just sort of curl back up under the covers, right? Um, yeah, so uh, in a response to uh, let's do this, we have a, an internal project that we're trying to kind of kickstart called Reuse Booster. And the idea is to just approach projects and either encourage them to uh, apply reuse or just just do it for them. Um, so it's it's a good way of uh, well, I'm not sure if it's a good way, but it's a way of of really you know getting uh, getting started. But I think uh, if any listeners are keen to participate, um, yeah, change your favorite uh, projects uh, to be uh, reuse compatible. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I know we have had, uh, I've certainly had conversations with the GitHub folks about their licensing tools. And uh, so hopefully, uh, licensee folks, uh, licensee is the GitHub tool that if any of you are out there, um, we'll, uh, I, Carmen and I are saying hi. <laughs> again, um, you know, do you, I, I mean, you know, for some projects, this is a very easy lift, 
right? If you've only got one or two licenses, uh, the tool can help you. It's very quick to standardize. More complex uh, projects, it's going to take more time. Um, I mean, Booster sounds like a great initiative to help, uh, especially with bigger projects. Um, and I suspect, I mean, have you, um, I suspect you all must have gotten good feedback from early adopters about how to improve it, right? Make it easier. Continuously, or... like uh, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of issues that are being opened by people who want to improve it just very slightly. And a lot of the issues get incorporated, but also sadly, a lot of feedback is just, just very slightly out of scope. Uh, and it's like, I would love to solve all of your issues, but we have to stay a little bit focused. Right. Well, especially, I'm sure a lot of these issues are things like, I mean, I'm just guessing here, but I'm sure some of them essentially fall into the category of, we cannot answer your legal questions for you, right? Right. Uh, we do our best. We have a massive FAQ on the website. Um, not legal advice, but it does answer a lot of very common questions. And a lot of them, like it's a massive list at this stage. Oh, interesting. I should check that out because that is something uh, certainly that comes up at Tidelift, right? When some of our tools flag, for example, you know, you mentioned that GitHub does license scanning. Uh, a common problem that we see is that what GitHub says your license is and what your what your package manager says your license is don't necessarily agree. <laughs> um, and you know, sometimes that's a scanning bug, right? The reason why I've talked to the GitHub folks is that I've discovered on occasion issues in their license scanner that we've been able to help fix, right? Um, but sometimes it's simply, you know, perhaps the the source of truth for the package manager is different from the source of truth for GitHub. And so they so they disagree and, and somebody has to do the, um, you know, somebody has to do the code archaeology. <laughs> um, and, uh, and boy, it sounds like maybe that FAQ is a great, because we certainly have, you know, we tell developers who are working with Tidelift, like, hey, yeah, you should uh, do this code archaeology. And they say, but I'm not a lawyer. I don't know how to do that code archaeology. <laughs> sounds like that FAQ could maybe be a good resource for them. Yeah. We've also recently begun uh, providing uh, some some helper scripts like on top of building on top of the tool uh, and one of them it's it's like a couple of lines of code that you can copy and paste into uh, into bash uh, which basically takes I wouldn't necessarily recommend it but it's one way of doing things which takes uh, all of the commit history and all of the authors from the commit history and just adds them to the file for every single commit um, which is really cool uh maybe not the best way of doing things because an author is not necessarily a copyright holder but uh it's maybe a way to get started and then clean up afterwards right right well and that's one of those things i mean one of the challenges of licensing and copyright more generally is that it's not something you can reduce to a script a lot of the time right scripts can certainly help <laughs> um, but they can't make calls about things like i was involved in a discussion with some lawyers just a couple of weeks ago actually that basically boiled down to if something is not copyrightable how do i indicate that in a source code tree and the correct i thought the correct answer was none of us can agree on what is or isn't copyrightable so when in doubt uh you know slap Creative Commons zero on it or whatever, or, you know, one of the other uh, zero licenses on it. And that didn't go over very well, actually, sort of, sort of surprisingly. I know uh, that's, that's been our recommendation as well at Reuse to slap CC zero on it, because we have to choose something like, because of the restrictions of how Reuse works, we have to choose something. Uh, and also SPDX, like SPDX doesn't really have a, uh, sorry, there's no license here. Well, there is, but it's not, it's complicated. Uh, on top of that, e even more complicated is public domain uh, in the sense that there's no public domain identifier for uh, within the SPDX. So if you take code that was entered into the American public domain, there's no way of uh, actually conveying that information in Rio's. Well, and to be fair, I mean, I think this is one of the interesting uh, 
the interesting sort of myths about public domain is that when you say American public domain, that's explicitly American, right? <laughs> Europeans, in fact, do not have a right. The, the US government reserves the right to start charging all of you for all this NASA source code. It's a practical matter, never going to happen, right? <laughs> but like, I mean, this is one of these things that I would imagine you all run into on a fair, um, a fairly regular basis as an objection or a concern, which is that the there's this tension between the work we should do for each other in the name of getting it right, right? Like, there, like I don't know quite what the name for it is, but as you were saying, I just want it to be accurate right like there is a um but there's a tension between that and okay but as a practical matter x is never going to happen right like we would love to have perfectly accurate public domain united states information but like the u.s government's not gonna sue you over that kind of stuff right like the relevant case law for that is like a hundred years old it's still accurate but there's no new case law because the u.s government doesn't bother right um yeah, and how do you negotiate, or maybe you don't, um, that tension of a developer saying, okay, but the risk is low, the risk is implausible? Well, we can't solve everyone's problems, even though I'd, uh, I'd really like to help everyone. So at some point, like, if you really disagree with something we've done, you can reuse this free software you can fork it and change it very slightly and do it exactly as you want to do it <laughs> um no, that the always the solution right taking we're taking patches um well so i want to end on a I, I think this has been a great conversation thank you so much for your time uh i want us i want to end this on a fun note if you could do one thing to like help adoption of reuse right like snap your fingers and like you know, what is it that you would love to see happen? I I think the thing I'd love to see happen is, so a lot of people, I, I'm always very inspired by uh, projects like Prettier and, and Black, which kind of auto format your, uh, uh, your code for you. If reuse could be incorporated into Black or Prettier, like that would force so many people to actually bother with adding the information. I think that is the dream to, in the same way that programmers have gotten used to uh, just, just letting a tool format their code, also letting a tool verify whether, uh, whether their copyright and licensing information is correct. Right, right. Hmm. I would love, I, speaking as somebody who has to pick up all the pieces professionally, that sounds amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm with you. Let's make that happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for, uh, for you know, we were talking right before we recorded. This is very much a volunteer project of, uh, of, of love or pedanticism or whatever uh, at this point for you. So, uh, you know, thank you for the time that you're pouring into this community. Uh, you know, really appreciate that. And, um, you know, I hope, uh, hope that the next five years of reuse, the next from 1.0 to whatever, are uh, successful and happy. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll get to that point of, of universal uh, adoption. That would be that would be terrific to see. Thank you uh, so much for having me. My pleasure.